All right, welcome to Learn SDR. I'm Prof. Jason. Uh, last time we talked about how transmitting rectangular pulses of information was extremely inefficient in terms of spectral use. And today we'll dive into more details on pulse shapes that are much better for transmitting information. So let me just review what, what we did last time. So before we, before we transmitted, as we were sending it to, to the radio, our pulses looked like this. So in, in time, we had uh, single pulses that were rectangular in shape. And I think last time I had 100 samples in each rectangular pulse. Um, and of course, when we transmit data, it's a series of these pulses. So when we do phase shift keying, the simple binary phase shift keying, there's one pulse that might be multiplied by positive one, and the next one might be multiplied by negative one, and then negative one again, and back to positive one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, for the data. Um, and we saw that the spectrum of the signal was extremely inefficient. So let me draw what the spectrum of this looked like in frequency. So uh, roughly there was quite, quite a, uh, a high center value, and then it fell off, and there were some side lobes that were quite high. So it looked like this, and it was symmetric around zero. And this, this just went on and on forever, falling a little bit in each direction. And the width, the bandwidth of the main spectrum here was two over the symbol time. So what is the symbol time? Well, the symbol time is the time that each symbol is given. So if we have a series of, of ones and zeros or plus ones and minus ones, each of those bits in the, pace, in the case of binary phase shift keying, each of those bits lasts for time t symbol. And the bandwidth of this was twice t symbol. So this is, this is rather inefficient. So the, the spectrum of an individual pulse ends up being the same spectrum as transmitting a whole random series of pulses. We'll see that today, or you could, you could check that. Um, but what we want is we want pulses that are uh, much better in terms of their spectral properties. So they don't spew all of this energy out farther than they need to. And uh, that, that's good for a couple of reasons. One is we will concentrate all of our transmitter power in a much narrower region and not, not, uh, not be louder for, for all of our adjacent neighbors and our adjacent channels. And two, when we receive it, we want to be able to filter on the narrowest region possible and reject all the noise and all the interference from adjacent channels. So the narrower we can make our, our uh, spectrum of transmission, the, the better we are able to filter out adjacent channels and noise. So let's go to the opposite extreme. The opposite extreme, so these I, I've been calling rectangular pulses. rectangular pulses in time. The opposite extreme would be to have a flat spectrum. So if we, we draw the spectrum first, frequency spectrum, that's not how you spell frequency, it's hard to write and talk, frequency. Um, if we had a frequency spectrum that was flat, we wanted to transmit data at the same rate. The sampling theorem says that the, the least amount of bandwidth we can use is one over one over the sample rate. So one over, uh, sorry, the symbol rate, one over T sub S. So this is half of the bandwidth of just this widest lobe. And where does that happen? Well, that happens if, if we happen to be transmitting, uh, you know, plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one. And you can work out that the bandwidth of that would, would work out to be uh, one over the, the symbol rate. And what would be the, the pulse shape that would give us this, this spectral shape? Uh, the pulse shape that would give us the spectral shape, and uh, you could call this rectangular in frequency, but really it's often called boxcar, boxcar uh, spectrum and frequency. The, spe the pulse that would give us this spectrum would be the inverse Fourier transform of this. 
what that looks like in time is let me let me draw a few samples here. So there's there's a sample, there's a sample, there's a sample, there's someone going to draw evenly, or not samples, evenly spaced uh, intervals here. The pulse that would give us this in time has a maximum right at the origin and goes negative and positive and negative, et cetera, all the way down, and that's symmetric. Goes negative. Positive, negative, and it dies off, but it dies off quite slowly. So this this sort of pattern continues for a long time, and the the way it dives dies off. You might recognize this function. This is a sine of x over x function, sometimes called a sinc function. And this this does die off, but it dies off very slowly. And in fact, if you take the absolute value squared of this and plot it on a log scale. That's that's what this is. So, the the Fourier transform of a rectangle is a sink, and when we plot it as the power spectral density on a log scale, it looks like this. And the inverse Fourier transform of a rectangle is also a sink, plotted here. So, if you were to work out what what is the timing on this, well, the the timing on this is that the the time between the maximum and the first zero crossing is t sub s, the symbol rate. And this provides a good hint as to how we might use this pulse. So let me write in a different color here. Uh, if I were to transmit one pulse and encode it with either a, a plus one or a minus one, so multiply this whole thing by either a plus one or a minus one, and the next one over, I can encode as a plus one or minus one starting where this one crosses zero. So let me, let me draw another sink here in a different color. So its maximum will be right where this one crosses zero. And if you work out where all the zero crossings are, uh, all the zero crossings are, are going to be at the same place. So this one goes down and up, down. And it goes down like this and up down and again it'll sort of continue on and on forever and in both both directions and so theoretically you could transmit pulses of information like this where for every piece of data either a plus one or a minus one you would take this entire sync function that goes on and on and on for a very long time and you would multiply it by either plus one or minus one and then a time t symbol later you would do the same thing, multiplied by plus one or minus one. Here I've drawn it multiplied by plus one, just so you can see the, the shift. And then you add everything together. And what happens is right at the places where you're sending a symbol, all of the other ones, no matter what they're multiplied by, are, are going to be zero right at, that, uh, right at the place where, um, where the next symbol goes. So, so this is... This is theoretically possible. It's theoretically possible to fit all the data in this theoretically minimal bandwidth by, by doing this. But this has a couple of problems. So, so this, the zero crossings are great. We've, we've aligned everything properly. But it falls off very slowly. And in any real system, we would want to truncate these pulses in time. And whenever you truncate these pulses in time, you're going to ruin the nice, clean frequency spectrum. So unless you wanted to really keep track of, of every single data bit way, 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 way before you want to transmit it and way, way, way after you want to transmit it, we need some sort of compromise. Um, and we'll see there's another problem with this will actually be a limiting case of our, of our compromise. And we'll see that another problem with really going to this limited, limiting case of really squeezing the bandwidth is that it's really hard to recover the, the timing and, and uh, the phase offsets and the, uh, from clocks that aren't quite synchronized. So, so what is the compromise? Compromise, I'll draw the spectrum first. Compromise frequency is called a raised cosine pulse. And the cosine, the raised cosine refers to the frequency spectrum, not, not the time spectrum. I'll show you what that looks like in a little bit. So what this is, let me draw a dotted version of the previous spectrum. So here's 
here's the same kind of limiting uh, boxcar spectrum. There's a, there's a box. And what we're going to do is on, on the ends here, we're going to slowly taper the, the end. So it'll be flat on top for a while, and it'll slowly taper down. And the, the form of the taper will be a raised cosine. So half, half, of, a, um, uh, half of a period of a cosine there and half of a period of a cosine there. And there's a free parameter we can adjust. And that's kind of how aggressively do we want to taper. So we'll, we'll have the parameter go all the way to, to 0, where we don't add any extra. And that limit of that will be the boxcar. And we'll have the parameter go all the way to 1. And that'll kind of eliminate this little flat, flat region on the top. And we'll have kind of a smooth, smooth cosine taper coming up. And it'll meet the smooth cosine taper coming down. And so if you were to write mathematically what that would be for different different cosines, you would see that the width here is one plus this parameter alpha over the symbol rate over T sub s. And alpha is often called the excess bandwidth. So if alpha was zero and we had no excess bandwidth, we would be at our limiting, our limiting case, our limiting bandwidth here. And alpha can often go up to one. And that's kind of the other limit. And at that limit, where, where we have no flat top, it, it, it's just the more slowly rising cosine meets the more slowly falling cosine, we take up twice the bandwidth we absolutely, uh, twice the absolute minimal bandwidth. And we're, we're not exactly back to this picture. We, we are only taking up the bandwidth of the one main lobe, but we still cut out all of this extra stuff on either side. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure something like the 3G cell standard uses these, these pulses with alpha being, I, I'd have to look it up, but you know somewhere in the range of 0.3. Uh, this is a pretty standard thing. So this is called a raised, raised cosine. And remember that the cosine is happening in, in frequency. If we were to draw what that looks like in time, it shares a lot of the, the great properties of this one. So let me let me draw some some points here, some evenly spaced points. So it it looks a lot like this one, except it dies off much quicker. So it still has a main central lobe that goes down, still has lobes that become come under. But the lobes don't go quite as far, and then they don't they don't go quite as far on the top. And you can you can cut this off much sooner. And only use a finite number of samples. That should be symmetric. I'll make it a little bit more symmetric on this side. Only use a finite number of, of samples here of this thing, and you're not going to ruin the, the spectral properties. So this this falls off much faster than than uh, than this one does. But it shares the properties where one symbol time later, or and two symbol times later, and three symbol times later each of these pulses is crossing zero. And so the adjacent pulse, if we were to draw it, say we're transmitting a plus one, and here we're transmitting a, another plus one. And at the end of the day, we're going to add all of these waves together. The next wave is going to look like this. It's going to start at maximum, go down. It's going to be very similar looking, but uh, much, much less uh, uh, it'll, it'll die off much sooner. And uh, we can choose alpha. That's a, that's a design parameter. And the trade-off is the smaller we make alpha, the closer we are to our absolute minimum frequency bandwidth. And the bigger we make alpha, the, what we'll see is that these pulses look, look nicer and nicer. They sort of look a little bit more like what you would expect bits to look like. And it also allows us to do things like uh, Recover the the carrier wave and the uh, the timing of the pulses. So let me show you uh, a GNU radio flow graph of of this in in simulation. I'm not going to build it up this time. Uh, let me let me give you a few words if you want to look look this up and, and learn more about it. This property of a pulse where the the next one over uh, happens, or all I should say, all of the next ones over happen at zero crossings, this is called the property of no inter-symbol interference. 
no ISI. So the, the blue symbol does not interfere with the red symbol because everywhere the, the blue symbol, uh, well, we're, the place where we want to sample the blue symbol is at a zero crossing of the red symbol and, and the next symbol and the next symbol and the next symbol. So there's no inter-symbol interference. And that property is shared uh, it, for, for any alpha. And the, uh, this raised cosine profile isn't the only profile and frequency that will get you this. Uh, there may be some others that have some slightly better properties in, in certain cases. Uh, and, and the thing to look up if you want to sort of prove this and look up more generally what the restriction is, is the Nyquist ISI criterion. So Nyquist, and uh, I'll just write it, Nyquist. Nyquist ISI criterion. That's how you spell criterion. Um, that there's uh, mathematical properties of this frequency spectrum that will guarantee this no inner symbol interference property where um, at the next sample, uh, all the preceding and following symbols are crossing right through zero. All right, so let me share my screen and show you a flow graph that simulates this and illustrates it. I'm not going to build this up in real time, but I will walk through it and, and show all of the, the features of it. So I'm gonna have two different sources and I'm gonna compare the two. One is a rectangular pulse. And each of the pulses is going to be 10 samples. So 10 actual analog to digital converter samples. That's what this uh, samples per symbol means, 10. So each, uh, the spacing between pulses is going to be 10. So when I have these rectangular pulses, I'm going to make the ones last for 10 samples. And then I'm gonna have zeros last for the rest of the samples in my, my demonstration. And you can see it, it'll pop up that what I'm actually gonna be simulating is 10 ones followed by a lot of zeros. So that's, that's the first path. I'm gonna just throttle that down to one mega sample per second. I'm gonna delay it so that I can compare with, with, a, with this stuff down here. And I'm gonna show it in time and in frequency. So what's going on down here? Well, the, the thing I wanna do here is make a raised cosine pulse in time. And the way you could do that is to have a single pulse. So a single one followed by a lot of zeros and pass that through a raised cosine filter. Now, GNU Radio doesn't have a raised cosine filter, and, and I'll explain why in a little bit. It has what's called a root raised cosine filter. And that's kind of the square root of the raised cosine filter. So you need to pass it through twice. And the properties of this raised cosine filter, I'm just simulating floating point numbers. I'm not bar bothering with complex in this simulation. Um, the gain just says amplify, amplify this pulse to be in this case, 10, 10 times as tall, you have to specify the sample rate. And the symbol rate is the sample rate divided by the number of samples per symbol. So uh, if this is one mega sample per second, this is gonna be uh, 100 kilosamples per second. And finally, you have to specify this, this alpha parameter, this uh, excess bandwidth parameter. And I've, I've uh, put that on a slider so we can change that and see what happens. Now, the last thing you have to specify is a little bit technical. It's the number of taps in this filter. So this is basically the length of the pulse. So the, the bigger you make this number, the more samples it will actually take before it just cuts off and says, okay, everything else is just gonna be zero. So uh, making this larger is, uh, is important. And just for this, for sake of this sim simulation, I'm making the, uh, I made this five, 511, it's, it's one less than 512, which is a power of two. And then I just did the same thing again. The only difference here is that I set the gain to be one so that I can easily compare the uh, raised cosine pulse, which is the result of this double filter with the square pulses. And again, I'm gonna plot that in time and in frequency. Now, finally, the last thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plot three versions of this. I'm gonna plot a direct version, one that's delayed by one symbol time, so delayed by 10 samples and delayed by uh, two symbol times, 20 samples. And I'll, I'll plot those in time. So let's, let's play that and I'll show you what all that means. 
Okay, so I have my slider here where I can adjust alpha, and I've started out with a kind of medium value of, of 0.5. And maybe the first thing to look at is the square pulse and the raised cosine pulse. Let me zoom in here and you can see them. So the square pulse is just this blue, I should, I should say rectangular pulse. This rectangular pulse in time is a blue rectangle here. And the raised cosine pulse has this property of uh, wiggling and dying off. And let me slide alpha back and forth. So if I make alpha bigger, I'm giving myself more excess bandwidth. And that means that it dies off sooner, kind of a simple hump. And if I go the other way, I'm really squeezing the bandwidth, which makes the pulse last longer and longer and longer and die off much less slowly. So those are my two extremes. And in the frequency plot, you can say that, see the same thing. But I reduce this down to, um, I, don't, I don't think I literally go to zero because uh, there's some numerical problems with the way the filters are calculated. But I can go to 0 0.01, so 1%. The spectrum of my rectangular pulse has all these side lobes, all this power out at high frequency. That's, that's not good if we have adjacent channels. And it's also not good if we have to receive all that stuff and, and not filter it out. Um, and this boxcar red frequency spectrum is for the limit where I've made alpha as small as possible. And as I make alpha bigger and bigger and bigger, the frequency spectrum spreads out more and more and more. And when I make alpha its maximum of one, the, the pulse has this sort of nice smooth profile, not a lot of ringing here. And the frequency spectrum is about the same as the, the side lobes of the original thing. So uh, that's, that's what it looks like, a single pulse in time and in frequency in both of those cases. And here I've just plotted three pulses right next to each other. So let's go back to uh, kind of the medium value of 0.5. You can see that for, for a middle pulse here, I can count 10 samples, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10. And that's, that's where it, the red pulse crosses through zero. And that would be where the next pulse begins. So either this would be multiplied by plus one or minus one if we're doing binary phase shift keying. Here, I'm just pretending I'm transmitting three ones in a row. And what you would actually transmit is the sum of, of all of this stuff. And so at the, the sample points here, like, like the, the places where the middle of the symbol exists, I'm getting exactly plus one or minus one. Here, I'm getting exactly plus one or minus one because all the others are going to cross through zero. And you can see that as I go through. For smaller alpha, the, the tails get longer and longer and longer and bigger and bigger and bigger. But I always maintain this property of no inner symbol interference. The zero crossings for all the other ones happen right where my next symbol would appear. OK, so that's for a single pulse. Let's actually transmit some data. That's what's happening at the bottom of the flow graph. So let's ask what happens when I actually do that, when I transmit some random data. So I'm going to slowly enable these blocks and describe what they each do. So here's a random uniform source. Uh, the minimum value is 0, and the maximum value, again, this is Python, so you actually go one beyond the maximum value. So this source is actually transmitting, is going to make zeros 0 or 1. I'm going to throttle that. I'm going to map those zeros and ones to ones and minus ones. I'm going to turn that into a floating point number just so I can filter it and plot it. And I'm going to do two things. One is I'm just going to make a square, a, a sequence of square pulses out of it. So each one I'm going to repeat 10 times. I'm going to delay it by some amount so I can compare the two, plot it in time and in frequency. And on the other path, I'm going to turn each of these into a single pulse. So basically the same thing I did before. I'll use this interpolating filter. And so each one is going to become, a, uh, is going to be multiplied. Well, sorry, each, each of these random numbers is going to turn into um, a one times that random number followed by nine zeros. So again, I have 10 samples per symbol. So if I'm getting, because of this map, I'm getting plus and minus one. What comes out of here is going to be pulses that are either plus one or minus one followed by nine zeros. Uh, I will plot those so I can see where these pulses happen. But then I'll filter. I'll do my double, my double filter to get a, a raised cosine filter and plot that. So let's, let's run that. 
Okay, so that's what's happening down here. And now you can see that there is some random data being transmitted. And if I pause this and zoom in, take a closer look at what's going on here. So let me pause it and zoom in. Okay, so the, the green is the actual pulses. So here I'm transmitting a plus one, here I'm transmitting a minus one, minus one, plus one, plus one, minus one, plus one. Um, the blue, where I'm not showing the samples just because it got too cluttered, would be the rectangular pulses, sort of square wave-ish signal. And the red is the raised cosine version of, of these pulses. So it's the sum of that this kind of function in time multiplied by plus one, and then a shifted version multiplied by minus one, a shifted version multiplied by minus one, all, all summed up, and you get this red, red plot. So let me play that. On the right, you see the frequency spectrum. Uh, I am plotting the frequency spectrum of this random, random bit stream, both in blue, if I turn it into a bunch of rectangular pulses, and in red, if I turn it into this uh, raised cosine. I've also plotted in green here what happens in between the two filters. So if I were to just filter it through one of the, the root raised cosine filters and not the other one, uh, I'm not plotting that in time, but you can see that the frequency spectrum in green looks pretty similar. And let me slide the slider around and you can see different, different, uh, different values of alpha, this excess bandwidth. So let me first give myself plenty of excess bandwidth here by going really, really high. Again, this pretty much turns every pulse into a nice smooth hump where there's not a lot of extra stuff going on. And you can see here, if I pause it, it's sort of pretty clear. Oh, this one's even really clear. This is just a bunch of negative ones and then a pretty smooth transition to a plus one and a bunch of negative ones. Let me try again, start, pause, some run of the random spot. So yeah, here you see a, a my, negative going pulse, two positive going pulses, negative going pulse, positive going pulse. Um, and the, the key is we have to recover the samples right, right at the maximum or minimum here, or, or really right at the correct timing. And we'll see the distinction in a second. So if I give myself less excess bandwidth, oh, and that excess bandwidth takes up basically the main lobe. If I give myself less excess bandwidth, if you watch the frequency plot, you can see it'll shrink. I'm doing some averaging here, so it takes a while to shrink. Let me go down pretty low, maybe to, uh, yeah, 5%. Maybe even down, let me go down, maybe even to 1%. And let me stop it here. Now it's a little, little bit less clear what's going on. You have to be really careful because at every green sample, it'll still exactly cross through that green sample. So if we were to sample this red waveform exactly here, we would get negative one. If we were to sample it exactly here, we would get plus one. But in between, as you squeeze the bandwidth down, Kind of all hell breaks loose in between, and you get some pretty wide maxima and minima, uh, and it's it's not uh, it's a little bit less clear if all I were to give you would was this red pulse. It's less clear where to sample. So, for example, uh, we're no longer sampling at the maxima and the minima. Those happen in between the places where we actually want to, to pick out the samples. But you know, our 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 uh, raised cosine profile here is extremely. Thin. It's the minimum theoretically allowed. And the root raised cosine has, has these tails, but I think this is down by quite a bit. I think that's an artifact of my finite sample length. So let me just give it a little bit more. And you can see that those, those tails pretty much go away without, without costing me much in excess, actual excess bandwidth. So that's 10%, 20%. Okay, so, so obviously a, a challenge going forward is going to be to figure out where to sample the incoming data stream to recover my ones and zeros. And that's what the next little bit of the flow graph is about. So let me stop that. And I'm gonna introduce you to a new plot. And the new plot is called an eye diagram. So let me enable these, these two eye diagrams. And what these are is there are plots in time, except what we're going to do is we're going to take one or two symbols worth of samples and plot the transitions over and over and over and over again. So for example, every uh, the time here in microseconds basically corresponds to samples. 
the way we the way we have uh, chosen it. And in fact, I can turn on the samples. Let me do that. Maze cosine line marker circle. And you can see that there are 10 samples between here and here. And what we're doing is we're we're just plotting two symbols worth of data and then starting again and plotting two more symbols and keeping that around for a while. So we're plotting several several things over each other. Now let me go to the kind of extreme wide wideband version and this is a little bit more clear. Okay, so so for this one at 0 and at 10 and at 20 that's where we really eventually want to sample the data. That's where it's always plus one or minus one. And in between, if we're going from a one to a one, those are all of these traces that pretty much go straight from one to one. And if we're going from a one to a zero, those are this set of trace or these set of traces that go, that go from one to zero. Same thing here. If we go from zero to one, there are these set of traces. But no matter where we're coming from, once we hit these, uh, you know, every 10 samples, we, we have exactly uh, exactly one or minus one. Now that's only for the raised cosine. That's not for the, the intermediate root raised cosine. I'll talk about that in a second. But let me decrease the excess bandwidth a little bit. And you can see that as I decrease the excess bandwidth, every 10 samples, we still get nice exact plus one or minus ones. But the stuff in between, depending on exactly where you came from, uh, is, is no longer simple transition. So there are many ways to go from one to one, depending on whether the previous bits were ones or zeros. And as I decrease this more and more and more, you know, all hell really starts to break loose in between the samples I care about. And the trajectory that I take to go from a one to a one or to go from a one to a zero, that really depends on where I came from and, and also where I'm going to go next because this, this waveform has been really smoothed out. Um, one thing to notice is that with the root raised cosine, the, we don't really have clean, clean ones and minus ones when we're kind of in this intermediate range here. If we happen to go all the way to the minimum, then you know, truly all hell has broken loose in between the, uh, the places where we actually want to uh, sample the symbols. But it just so happens that the root raised cosine also nicely, uh, nicely aligns here. And I'll explain why that is in a second. So, so this, is, this is what we're going to have to deal with in order to keep our bandwidth small. And let me talk about why we have why GNU Radio doesn't have a raised cosine filter, but it has a root raised cosine filter instead. And we had to use two of them here. And that's, that's, the, that's the next topic.